Hello there friends, my name is Rachel GNS Middle, Gilbert and Sullivan is my middle name and my middle name is my last name and I am here today on behalf of Forbear Theatre to explore the magic of the Gilbert and Sullivan operas by very pedantically ranking every element of them and today we are going into one of our big endgame lists and that is which Gilbert and Sullivan opera has the best musical numbers. This is a little bit different to music as we all know the operas of Gilbert and Sullivan are about far more than just the music, the lyrics are to be considered, the characters, the comedy, the dramatic stakes, emotional stakes. There's so much to be considered in these numbers and so this list will be quite a bit different to my music, my general music list. Although I am using it as a framing device, talking about which opera has the best musical numbers, that's not really the way to look at it. I've actually posted the full list in the comments, it's too big for the description. But just so you know, I don't really consider it a terribly useful thing to do, to look at to look at the list as the opera that has the best musical numbers. I kind of think really we should be focusing on the master list itself of all the numbers, but it would be a very boring video if I just read out that list to you, especially since it is 374 items long. So in response to my music <clears throat> ranking video, several people said both on the video and also privately to me that they felt that the fact that I had included some songs and not others was a bit unfair so I've taken that into account I'm going to tell you what I've done I have just gone ahead and eliminated any number on the list that has done badly because it is either short or contains repeated material so I've taken things out like I'm a Waterloo house young man I've taken out good morrow good lover and good morrow good lover I I've taken out fairly well attractive stranger I've not taken out why who is this approaching because I actually think it is long enough and that is actually a reason why maybe the Grand Duke and trial by jury have got a bit of a bum deal from this list I think because they do seem to contain more like very short songs <laughs> than the average GNS opera the list actually did change as a result of this not by too much I think there were a couple, the two operas moved up one place and two operas moved down one place. So it did actually make a bit of a difference. But um, I'm going to tell you now that because of that, um, there actually aren't 374 numbers in this list because... I've taken some out at the bottom, but I didn't want to rescore them all again because that would have taken me so long <laughs> and I'm so tired. <laughs> and honestly, like the difference of me saying something has 374 points rather than 373, that's going to make such a tiny infinitesimal decimal difference in the final result. But there really is no point in me taking the time to do that. It's going to produce the same ranking whatever happens and also this time I have included numbers from the act one finales what I've done is I've split the act one finales into their kind of separate numbers obviously I've not included every single bit of them because some bits are just transitions but whenever I feel there's an actual song in an act one finale I've taken it out and included it in this list so I will be talking about different songs than are in the music list so with that in mind let's get started and of course at the bottom of the list sadly at number 14 is Thespis. I feel Thespis is always going to come at the bottom of this list firstly because we don't know the music and it's very difficult to imagine what it could have been with the little with the little information that we have but also the lyrics do seem to lack a bit of imagination and dramatic stakes compared to compared to I would say all of the other operas, really. But the absolute worst number, I think, in GNS is here far away from all the world. I find it so underwhelming as a romantic duet. You've got these two characters that you've been told by the dialogue that these are not particularly likeable people. And then they sing like a love duet, which isn't even that romantic. Like, <laughs> you just think, what what on earth is this? I wonder what the music was. This. Maybe it was like upbeat. Who knows? I doubt it was. But I don't see any way of any people making this work in such a way that we're like, oh, oh, what, what is, what is a song for? Nobody knows, unless you do. With two points right at the bottom of the list again is we can't stand this. That is the Act Two finale of Thespis. I find it clunky both lyrically and. I don't really see there's any way that the music could work. They sing something like, they'll become eminent tragedians who no one ever goes to see, who never 
who never, never ever goes to sea. And that was, that's quite witty. And it kind of begs the question, like, how could that have been anything else? And is that just a coincidence? Because <laughs> that, that is quite cool. I don't find this number dramatically interesting or even sensical. I find it a bit confusing. And in with just three points is throughout the night, the constellations. Yeah, I, I, as an opening, I think this is the most underwhelming opening ever. It doesn't really tell you anything about the characters. The solo in the middle that the star sings is like, it's okay. What can we do to gain attention? It's kind of saying what the problem is. But like when we think of, say, the opening to Patience, that's also kind of quite downbeat and low key. But it also manages to be so dramatic and so comedic. And this just falls so utterly flat in comparison. However, there are a couple of songs in Thespis that I do think are really cool. Olympus is now in a terrible muddle. I think the lyrics in that are great. Of course, we don't know what the music was, but it's a patter song. It probably wouldn't have been too masterful. I also love Little Maid of Arcady. I think it's a cracking song. I don't think it's very interesting narratively. It has nothing to do with the story of Thespis, but that wasn't really what musical theatre was trying to do in those days. It was trying to just kind of create a lot of little fun songs. It, it, it was burlesque. It wasn't really meant to be an opera in the same sense that some of these other ones seem to be trying to be. Also, with 185 points, so that's done pretty well. 185 points, 190th place, so that's about, we're just over halfway down the list, is I Once Knew a Chap. Again, it's a great song. It's another patter song. I think it's really fab. It's, it tells like quite a compelling story. I did have to get Will to explain it to me because I do, I do find it a bit hard to follow, but it is a fun story and it's a lot of, it, it gives the chorus and the director and the actors like it gives them a lot of chance to play around and do something silly and fun so yeah but Thespis is not terrible it definitely has some potential I probably will put Thespis on one day but it'll just be for completion's sake but it's got some nice moments in there in 13th place I have given to HMS Pinafore I am afraid even though there are some very charming numbers in this opera and, you know, some have done really, really well, it's not overall, it is one of the weaker ones. I have given nine points to reflect my child. I think it's got some promise in it. The lyrics are quite clever, but ultimately I think it falls dramatically flat and it doesn't really help progress the narrative and I can definitely see why people cut it, but I probably will go on to include it because it's, it's nice for completion's sake. It's nice for people to see in a shorter opera which can afford to put cut material back and I think it's fun for people to see an opera they've seen loads of times before mm. having a song they've not heard before. So I probably will still include it. With 10 points I've given Things are seldom what they seem. I don't find this duet very compelling at all. As I've said in the past, the issue with things are seldom what they seem is that one character has a secret and the other is oblivious, but the audience is also oblivious to it. And I can see why, but it just means the whole song is like, I know something you don't know. Oh, do you? Yeah. I, I don't understand. Oh, you will soon. And it's just old sayings, you know? So while well, I think it's charming and it's sweet, and I would certainly never suggest cutting it just as a dramatic number, it's it just, it falls very flat again because it's it, it doesn't, I don't think the audience particularly like not being let in on something. And like Buttercup seems to be kind of quite enjoying the secret, but then late, but then earlier and later in the same opera, she seems kind of, Oh, like really haunted by it. So it's interesting how she seems playful in this number, but this is actually a secret she's struggling with. So yeah, it's problematic. With 24 points, I've given the on track. That was one that I'd accidentally missed off the music list, but it wouldn't have affected Pinafore's ranking in it. There's nothing wrong with the on track. I actually think it's quite pretty, but it's just, is it necessary for the story? No. There's probably a reason they stop doing these like separate entracts. Instead, you get to see operas that have long introductions to numbers, but that have the spirit of the number that follows it. But this, it stops and then Fair Moon to the Icing starts. So it just feels a bit, oh, uh, okay, that, that was nice, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> this is maybe just me not being used to opera. I only really know GNS, so I, I'm not, I don't know, I don't really know too many 
full scale big operas, maybe this is more of an operatic convention that Sullivan was trying to do. Someone can tell me in the comments. <clears throat> no, there have been three songs that are done really well in this. I love Carefully on Tiptoe Stealing. That gets 308 points. There's so much in that. It starts off really comedically with the, it was the cat and again the cat, <laughs> which I find hilarious. It then transitions to the pretty daughter of mine. And, oh God, dramatic sakes, dramatic sakes. And then my favorite bit in the whole opera, who dared to raise his wormy eyes above the dust to which you mold him. And, oh, Here's an Englishman, behold him. It's so badass. I absolutely love that moment. And then he is an Englishman. <sighs> and I won't bother to talk about the other two because it's the same top two numbers that got on the music list, but a nightingale <coughs> slash a maiden fair to see and the hours creep on a pace are just two of the absolute most dynamite numbers in the canon for a tenor and a soprano. They are so beautiful, but also so dramatic and so heartrending. This is not an afterthought, like Sullivan and Gilbert. Sullivan and Gilbert, who are they? I've said that before. But both Gilbert and Sullivan really knew what they were doing here, and it's definitely, it's not an afterthought, and it's, I think it's more reminiscent of their later work when it feels like they're not trying to create something frivolous. It feels like they're really trying to create something real and human and powerful. And because of that, those two numbers are just the absolute stands out for me. Number 12 goes to Trial by Jury. So, so far, this list is very similar to the music list, but it actually does get dramatically different after this entry. Now, Trial by Jury was one of the ones that did quite a lot better when I removed a few smaller numbers, but it actually didn't change its position because it was so firmly in this spot by very many points. So even though it gained about 30 points from me doing that, it didn't, it didn't change its position. So Trial mm. by Jury is one of those ones that's not really terribly useful to rank alongside the others because it does contain a lot of these really short numbers. The bottom one I've got is, oh, never, never, never since I joined the human race, which is one that I felt I, it was long enough to be included as a number. But I feel it's a bit disjointed and I think it's a little bit lacking in emotion, but it's because it's a transition. It's because it's not really intended to be a number, but I felt like it was long enough that I had to include it. If I included why who was this approaching, I had to include this one. <laughs> but then with 63 points, you get comes the broken flower. And 62 points to get, oh, gentlemen, listen, I pray. Now, these, again, these are both perfectly mm. fine songs, but they're a little bit shorter, a little bit mm -hmm. shallower than some of the other songs in this list. I think that these characters are not terribly deep or interesting. I don't know how compelling what they're saying is. So while the music is pretty, I don't really think these songs are ever going to, to, to elicit anything more than, ah, oh. ah. Oh. Whereas if you look at some of the songs later on this list, it, it, they, they are worlds apart. However, in Trial by Jury, we've got three that have done extraordinarily well. With 255 points, we get a nice dilemma. As Marisa was talking about at length, you get that really cool metric modulation, which I still to this day mm. don't really understand and would like her to explain to me again. Anything that you feel like the dynamics in it are inherent and are obvious, because you just feel it it does something to your inside and you just know what the dynamics should be. Anything like that, I'm like, Mwah. yes, yes, please. We want more things like Nice Dilemma, Gilbert and Sullivan, if you're out there, please. With 264 points, we get Hark the Hour of Ten is Sounding. I mean, this is one of the best openings in the canon. It's so full of energy. I could have ranked this and Ring Forth You Bells in quite a similar zone. They're two really punchy openings. You get told exactly what's going on, where you are, and it's just so exciting. It really makes everyone go, oh, okay. So Gilbert and Sullivan had done Thespis a few years ago, and then people come to see Le Pericle. Oh, it's got a little pre-show show called Trial by Jury by Gilbert and Sullivan. Oh yeah, those are, those are the people that did Thespis, that was all right. Then they sit down and they hear Heart the Hour. They must have completely lost it. That's what I imagine people doing all those Victorians going. This song would have really blown their socks off from the absolute get-go. Two songs which have also done really well. With 274 points, we get Now Jury Men Hear My Advice. With 248 points, we get the Council song, May It Please You, My Lord. I absolutely adore these two songs. I think they're examples of songs in Trial by Jury where you can really tell that not only are there dramatic stakes at play here, 
but they're so, so funny and so ironic. Gilbert's like tongue-in-cheekness, his dryness is so obvious here, like especially with the Usher's song. All kinds of vulgar prejudice, I pray you set aside. I listen to the plaintiff's case, observe the features of her face, the broken-hearted bride. From bias three of every kind. <laughs> It, I just think it's so clever. And then the chorus come in from bias, silence in court, silence. I find it so exciting, so full of character, and it transitions perfectly into the defendant coming on. Really, really love this song. I think it really deserves to be in the top half of this list. In 11th place, we have an opera that has gone down right to the bottom from the very top, and that is Utopia Limited. Interestingly enough for me, because I thought that this would also do pretty well in musical numbers, but the trouble is with it, it's just got quite a few shorter numbers like the Tarantella, it's got a King of Autocratic Power We, a Wonderful Joy Our Eyes to Bless, those are the three that came in the bottom of this list. And there's more as well, the Bold Face Ranger, I don't think did particularly well. There's just a couple of numbers and a, a few of the numbers in the Act One finale as well. I'm Captain Corker and KCB. These are numbers which, you know, you can see they're good and they're, they're not terrible. They've not done terribly on the list because the vast, vast majority of songs on this list are good. There are maybe only about 10 to 20 that I'm thinking those are not very good songs. But honestly, the problem with Utopia Limited is just that there are so many characters, there's so many songs, there's so much going on that it's just that some of those shorter ones, which I did have to include because they are songs, but some of the shorter songs did bring <clears throat> the others down. But the songs that have done really, really well, with 342 points, we get with, Briley, with Wiley Brain upon the spot. With 354 points, we get in Every Mental Law. And do you remember me going on and on and on about that musical number and how good it was? It won the duets list. I actually decided that it didn't win the duets list and because what I did was I felt that in light of how I've been marking these most recent lists, I thought it's actually not fair for some for some categories of songs to give them marks for comedy because if they're romantic songs they're not really meant to be funny at all so what i did was i split the duets up into love duets and other duets and when i did that uh i then put those lists mm. side by side and then i just did it intuitively from what i thought was the case and that meant that the frederick mabel duet actually did win but still having said that this song did very very well 354, that means it came 21 in the best musical numbers. I still think this is one of the cleverest numbers in the canon. I think it's absolutely superb and I really, really enjoy it. But my favourite musical number in Utopia Limited is one that I've actually taken out of the Act 1 finale and that's Henceforward of a Verity. I find it one of the most fabulous, fantastic, exciting moments in the canon. There's a couple of end of act two finale sections that have come above it. I won't tell you which until I get to them. It's mostly the music. I'm going to tell you that now because I, I think that the dramatic stakes are maybe a tiny bit confusing because you're not really quite sure what is being celebrated or feared. I think the focus isn't as clear. This is what the issue is with Utopia Limited. Great concept, not a clear execution. But the end of this act one finale is absolutely mind-bending, especially the section, the who loves, who loves, loves, <laughs> la, da, da. That, that key change, that kind of whole section where Scaffio and Fant is, here we're up to a flavor, so I can blow, he go down to a spurty, I think we ought to know, he go up, blow up a dynamite, he go up, of course he will, you're right, you're right, ha, 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 da, 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 da. Like that whole section is like, it's really, really good. Give it a listen if you don't know what I'm talking about. Just listen for Henceforward or a Verity. Definitely deserves to be really, really high on this list. In 10th place, we have Radagor. Now this one has done a little bit better than it did in the music list because I have taken out a few of those numbers that were a little bit throwaway. I did though keep in He Yields, He Yields because I thought that contained enough material to merit it being a number in its own right. Actually, 
it takes a while for it to go back into the Painted Emblems tune, so I thought that was correct. And also, it's brilliant and it's actually done all right. But there are still some songs, even when I consider the actual numbers in Rudigal, there are still some songs that I don't rate particularly highly. From the Briny Sea, I really don't like this number that much at all. Like, I don't hate it. I don't think it's particularly bad. The lyrics don't scan very well. I don't think Sullivan set it very well, and I think he's also set it in this way that's very unimaginative. Some of the tunes in Radagor are so simple. As I was saying in the previous video, I think it's maybe an attempt to kind of lull us into this sense of village idyllicness, and then we go to the ghost <laughs> section, and, you know, indeed, Bad Margaret's aria. But the music in Radagor, you get this impression that it's amazing, but I feel like it doesn't start to get good until a little bit later and a lot of the numbers in it are actually musically quite underwhelming but when it comes to musical numbers it has done a little bit better fair as roses bright may day is another one that i just think is a little bit vanilla i ship dsc i feel like pinafore does hornpipe better than than Rudigore. i just i don't really think that mm -hmm. this tune is particularly inspiring to be honest though Three numbers I have done really, really, really well. They also did high. They also did pretty well on my music list, but some did even better on this list. So with 335 points, we get Painted Emblems of a Race, which I've talked about enough in my chorus numbers video, but that one was first place in my chorus numbers and very deservedly so. Oh, Why Am I Moody and Sad gets 363 points. So, a Why Am I Moody and Sad is my number 12 overall of musical numbers. This is just the perfect introduction to a character. It's so sinister and so vulnerable. What a cracking number. And then a number nine, we get Mad Margaret's aria, Cheerily Carols the Lark. When we just considered music, this one didn't do quite as well, but it's gone up a couple of points when we consider everything about the number. Cheerily Carols the Lark is actually the second best solo number on this list. Number one is a solo number, and th this is the second best solo number. And then there is one solo number in between Cheerily Carols a Lark and Oh Why Am I Moody and Sad, but Rudigal has two of the top four solos, I think, in the canon. Why Am I Moody and Sad? Maybe some people wouldn't consider it a solo, but you know what I mean. This Rudigal contains such incredible material. It's just let down by a few numbers kind of quite early in the opera that are just a bit forgettable and underwhelming, even if dramatically I find Rodrigo to be mm. one of the most interesting, but that's for next week. Number nine, we have The Pirates of Penzance, another opera that I feel is consistently good and it kind of has this really strong theme, but I don't really know if, because it's an earlier opera, I don't think it has some of the musical expertise that occurs later in the operas. And the Pirates of Penzance has done quite a bit better on this list than it did when we were just considering music. So it has gone up a couple of places. Poor Oh Paul the Pirate Sherry is not a song that I particularly like. I think it's by far the worst opening. I mean, not including Thespis because we don't know what the music was. I find it just so underwhelming when you consider how lively the pirates chorus should be it's very stately i think it, i don't like the long note somebody i think a few a few videos ago said that i had criticized this one for having long notes but i didn't criticize the gentleman of japan for having long notes and what's so interesting about that is that yeah you're right this has long notes, and that one also has really long notes. But the difference is, whenever you see the Mikado in that opening chorus, I never hear people struggling to sing those long notes. They always sound very steady and very solid. But in this one, it sounds like people are struggling to hold on to them. And I guess that in a professional production, that wouldn't be the case. Uh, I don't see many professional productions of Pirates, so I can't really judge that. But... Certainly, this is a number that just sounds like it's an effort, whereas Gentleman of Japan doesn't. I don't know if that's because it's just like it's a little bit more exciting, but this one to me just doesn't have any excitement to it. And I think it sounds laboured. It sounds like it's a lot of work. And it's quite low down. 
it's quite low. Maybe that doesn't really help. But when you compare this to if you want to know who we are, I think they're absolutely worlds apart. <clears throat> I, I, and maybe I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but this one just lacks so much life to me. Dry the Glistening Tear is another one that's not done terribly well, I'm afraid. This is one that it's quite difficult to make anything out of. Whenever I play Mabel, this is easily my least favourite bit to sing. It's very one note. The song lasts like a good three or four minutes, like it's a long song. And all it's saying is, Father, what are you doing out of bed? It's dark. It's cold. What are you doing? <laughs> Like nothing else is happening. And I appreciate that some openings don't need to say very much. But this one isn't even funny. Like it's it's not doing anything. It's just a you know, it's, it's just like, okay, let's just wait for this song to be over. It's very hard as a director to do anything with this. You kind of just have to do a pastiche of opera, really. It's if you do this one seriously, I just find it falls it falls very flat. Also with 42 points, I've given to When Frederick Was a Little Lad. That is a song I do not care for. I have played Ruth twice. I do not enjoy singing this song. Once this song is over, I'm like, okay, good. I can relax now. But I find it just, it's only narrative. And the narrative is quite funny. The pilot pirate confusion is okay. That's why I got 42 points rather than less. But musically, it, it's very underwhelming. But there are three songs on this list that I have given an extraordinarily high mark to. With 345 points, we get, oh, is there not one maiden breast? So that one comes in 30th place, which might sound quite low, but there are 374 numbers on this list. So actually, it's done pretty well indeed. What a gorgeous, dramatic song. Surely for a tenor, like the absolute ultimate, is getting to sing, I love you, I love you, I love, I love you. Isn't that just the ultimate in sheer, vulnerable, joyful expression? With 367 points, we get When the Foeman Bears His Steel. So that turns out in eighth place on this list. I think a lot of the reason why it ended up so high is for its sheer iconic value. I think that there's just some part of me that does appreciate that this is a song that is both iconic and really good, and that must mean that it does something. So there are certain other kind of quite iconic songs that have done very spectacularly badly on this list so it's, it's that's not the only thing i'm taking into account but the double chorus in this number is one of the most exciting things in the canon anything that's kind of militaristic but this involves so many different layers and parts especially when it's sung with the right rhythm taran tara taran tara not taran tara taran tara it shouldn't be swung don't swing it it's also as well as being musically excellent it takes you on a journey, both musically and dramatically. It starts off with the policeman feeling very proud coming on, and then they kind of realise what they've got themselves in for. So it's that slow realisation, but at the same time, the energy of the daughters is like going up to a fever pitch, and they're getting more and more excited, and the policemen are getting more and more terrified. And it's just this comedic mismatch of stakes and priorities and it's just that's just what comedy is comedy is like kind of misunderstanding and like things not adding up like people going into one situation while feeling very very different things and one half being oblivious one half not being oblivious but the audience is allowed in on the joke and the audience can very much see that there's a dichotomy there and to me that is just it is just Everything that is so good about Gilbert and Sullivan in one number. So I think this is a really fantastic one. And in sixth place overall, I have put All Is Prepared, Your Gallant Crew Await You. Now, somebody commented that I didn't, um, I've not really yet talked about Our Leave Me Not To Pine as a number in its own right. And like, let me do that now, because maybe it does deserve to be talked about in its own right. But really every section of this, is absolutely gorgeous. We start with the recit, where it's actually quite funny, but you are 21. <laughs> oh, catast oh, horrible, oh, catastrophe appalling. But stay, oh, Frederick, hear me. Stay, Frederick, stay. They have no legal claim. It's like, no, she's still fighting. She's fighting for Frederick. And, and then they have that argument 
Stay, Frederick, stay, I must obey. Da, 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 da. Ah, leave me not to pine alone. I think sometimes the mistake here is that people play this defeated. But listen to the words. Ah, leave me not to pine. She's still pleading for him to stay. She's 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 not given up yet, you know? And that and that can be so much more tragic than somebody defeated. You know, the fact that she still has hope. And then he comes to her and explains, no, like very softly. He love like, I love you, but I have to go. And then there's this kind of acceptance there. And then from that acceptance comes another really, really funny moment. It seems so long. <laughs> and then they go into the, oh, here is love, or here is truth, and here is love, oh, here is love. It's a dramatic and emotional roller coaster. And I think it's right to include it as one number because it so seamlessly transitions. And I think that while some people might say that I should have I should have made I'll Leave Me Not to Pine a separate number because it's just so musically beautiful, I imagine that had I done that, the number in its entirety would not have done so well. I think that because I included all three bits of that together, it's actually done quite a lot better as a result. Sixth place that came. So that's, you know, it's right up there with some of the, I'm, I'm going to go over the top 20 again as a reminder at the end, but it's come amongst some really, truly mind bending stuff from other operas that arguably have better music. So this one has done really, really well. In eighth place, moving down one section, since I did a little bit of diddling with removing some songs, is The Sorcerer. I happen to think The Sorcerer has some fantastic musical numbers. It also has some that are maybe a little bit messy or forgettable. Oh, I have wrought much evil with my spells. This actually came dead last place in my music list, but it, only, it came 28th from bottom in this list because I do appreciate that this number has some comedic and dramatic value. But honestly, it's music and it's lyrics. I, I really don't think are very good at all. However, I had William Remmers and Isabel play these parts when I directed The Sorcerer very briefly several years ago, and it was fantastic. So I do think people can make something of this song. My Kindly Friends, Oh Happy Young Heart. It gets 52 points, so it doesn't do badly. And the thing is, it's on the list of soprano arias, and the soprano arias was a particularly strong list. So even though this came bottom of that list, it's not a bad song. It's just very one note compared to some of the other big soprano arias in the canon. Or He or I Must Die gets 55 points. So that's the act two finale of The Sorcerer. I just find the death of John Wellington Wells going into the into the transition of now to the banquet press where the lyrics are not really changed it's just the same again so it's not really saying anything different I find just makes for quite an unsatisfying ending I've talked about the ending of the sorcerer a lot I do find it a bit strange I think that there are maybe some creative choices you could make that would make it a bit more exciting I am really excited to see the Charles Court Sorcerer. I know they're probably going to do, going to do something incredible mm -hmm. with this ending. So um, that's going to be in 2024. I can't remember the venues for now. I know it's going to go to the festival, but I cannot wait to watch the Charles Court Sorcerer to see how they deal with this weird problematic ending. Mm -hmm. But three songs in this list that have done really well, one which I've never really talked about because it's part of an Act One finale, mm -hmm. with 333 points, so in 42nd place overall, I have given to Oh Marvelous Illusion. So this is another one of those end of the Act One finale sections, which has done very well on this list. One of the most delicious musical sections in the canon, honestly. That's why The Sorcerer did so well in the music list. It was a lot of it was because of its Act One finale. It, it is musically absolutely spectacular. Oh Marvelous Illusion, a terrible surprise. Oh Marvelous Illusion, a terrible surprise with Constance. Oh Marvelous Illusion, Ellie. Oh, Marvelous Illusion. I, I love singing that bit as Constance. That was probably my favourite part of the opera. I actually probably preferred that to any of my solos. Just being part of that of that big wall of sound. It's a little bit like Nice Dilemma. It's quite reminiscent of that, the fact that you have it and then it repeats. I would say that it's repeat and the fact that it's the same both times. I, does that maybe mean <clears throat> it kind of lacks something dramatically? I don't know. Maybe that's not fair. It didn't do better than you know, the equivalent bit in Utopia Limited, for example, which I think is more spectacular than this, but this is one of the most beautiful moments in the canon, for sure. I know Joanna absolutely loves it, so Joanna, please feel free to write an essay in the comments about why this number should have come number one.
coming in 22nd place is Thou Hast the Power. What a cracking aria. As I keep saying over and over again, like I don't really like it when people deliberately go to anger when they're making a choice of how to be in a Gilbert and Sullivan opera. I don't think Gilbert really had anger in his mind a lot when he was writing these characters. But that means that when there are these truly furious moments, they really do stand out. Like this one and a lot of stuff that Scafio and Fantas do. Like this number is one of those really spiteful, bitter numbers where somebody can really go to town. But having said that, I think you could you could get a lot more satisfaction from actually seeming like you're kind in this. Your love is like a flower that fades within the hour. It's like patronising. Somebody, like, I just get so much kind of, like, kind of both catharsis, but also, like, PTSD flashbacks <laughs> from, like, listening to this number because I remember, like, how much in past relationships but maybe most recently my most recent boyfriend before this one and how he tried to tell me that I was like being a girlfriend wrong and that no this is the correct way to be in a relationship and it really made me think like oh wow I'm completely failing as a partner and as a person I need to do better I need to just be a better person and it you really start to believe that after a while when someone just tells you that over and over again and and it meant that like I didn't even really have the strength to break up with him because for several months I was just kind of thinking oh wow well he's right I just have to be better this is not this is not that I have to leave the relationship and find somebody more suited it's just that I am not a good person <laughs> like and I need to just be better and that was what his words made me feel and that's why like when I see this number I'm like wow Gilbert really had this insight into that kind of abuse or did he because I bet people will listen to what I'm saying and say oh no he wasn't thinking of that at all I mean, do you know that? Do we know that? Do we? I don't know. I mean, you guys tell me what you think about it. Is it just the coincidence that, like, I never really used to resonate that much with it? I didn't really know what this song was about. But after having been in an abusive relationship where somebody's gaslighted me, I'm like, like, this is exactly how that is. That That is exactly what he would have said, you know? And it's, it's, it's scary. It's really scarily accurate, this. And it's... It's, it's, it's eerie. It actually makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable, like how accurate this song is. But because of that, it's fantastic because songs should be challenging you and making you look at like real human issues and real human problems in relationships. Like this is a real thing that happens to people. And Aline's not stupid. You know, it's just that she's been love bombed by him. Alexis love bombs her. And that makes the audience think, oh, wow, he's such a wonderful, sweet, romantic, loving guy. And then he does this, like the second there's any conflict, it's like, no, Aline, you're incorrect about what love is. Because my love is correct and your love is wrong. And yeah, I'm telling you, that is, 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 it's, not, it's not a good state to be in. It's, it's not a good state to be in at all. And I had to go straight out of that relationship and he was still in my house. I couldn't even get him out of my house that I own. I had to go straight from that relationship into directing three shows at the Gilbert and Sullivan Festival in 2021. And I remember just like telling all three of my cast, like, I don't want anyone to ever be angry in any of these three offices. I, I can't look at anger. I'm just allergic to it right now. Like that was, it was traumatizing that was. I, I didn't even tell, really tell anyone at the time, but I was like, when, when I was directing those three operas, at the, the three out of the six operas at the 2021 GNS Festival, I was in like a severe <laughs> like mental collapse. I was having a really, really hard time. And I'm just like, didn't really have anyone to talk to about it it was it, that was really really tough but um we got through it and my career has gone from strength to strength <laughs> since then so yeah that, that that's good isn't it my favorite song in a sorcerer is actually my name is john wellington wells so that's good that gets 356 points in 19th place what a great number I, I know it's just a patter song. I know it's ostensibly quite simple, but it's actually really not. It's actually so exciting. It's got so many colours in it. And when you think about this song as, oh, it's not just like a standard song that a guy's rattling out. 
this is a sales pitch like this guy needs to sell and when you and i've said this ten thousand times but if you imagine he's a similar kind of character to jack point in that he's really struggling and needs to sell his needs to puff his goods even though he says i'm not in the habit of puffing my goods he kind of is like he's kind of doing that all the time <laughs> but this is a sales pitch and he desperately needs to get this sale because this this is like the two most eligible kind of fancy people in the village like if he can sell the love potion to them he's, he's made so it's so important he gets this gig and when you imagine that song with those stakes added onto it it just automatically makes it more exciting and why wouldn't you want to make it more exciting number seven and an opera that has done a little bit better when i did some diddling is iolanthe iolanthe does have like a few numbers on this list that I don't think are particularly exciting, I've included as my three bottom places, though perhaps I may incur your blame, when Britain really ruled the waves and when all night long a chap remains. These are three songs that they all have quite iconic value, but I think in terms of musical structure, in terms of the vocal line, in terms of lyrics, dramatic stakes, emotional stakes, I don't really find them that interesting. They are three songs that whenever they begin, I, I'm not really kind of listening. And it takes quite a lot for an actor to actually bring these lyrics to life. It's funny, it's satire, but it's, it's one joke. And that's the same thing with When Britain Really Ruled the Waves, it's one joke. And it's a really long song for just one joke. And it, I just find that there are other numbers in other operas and also in this one that just tell you a lot more in a better, quicker, funnier way than these two. Though perhaps I may incur your blame, I just don't really find it interesting. It's a bit of a wet end to a, a not so interesting subplot that we don't really care so much about, that we're not really that invested in. And it's a shame because the scene preceding it is so good and then I just find this one's a bit, oh, okay. And Willis's little entry into it and rests it in the middle of the song, yeah, it's funny, but it also means that it grinds to a halt and the energy just goes... <sighs> it's very, very hard as an actor to do this song in a way that is interesting, as a person who's played Phyllis several times. But let's talk about the songs that did very, very, very well with 349 points. That is 26th place. We have Loudly Let the Trumpets Bray. What a magnificent entrance those peers have. It's, it's just absolutely spellbinding. I think that it's one of those songs that where, you know, I was talking about Poor, Poor the Pirate Sherry, when I think people don't give the notes their full values or it's like harder to give the notes their full values. In this one, this, this one just inspires the chorus to be utterly bombastic and dramatic and very austere and overly posh. The lyrics and the tune just helps them do that. And that's what I think sometimes is the difference between really good and like not so good songs in this list. It's that I'm not saying that people can't sing the full values of notes or that long notes are inherently bad, but it's just that if you do write long notes, you've got to inspire your singers to actually have the energy to really give those notes their full, mm. both musical and dramatic value. Otherwise, it's just going to come across as a bit... Uh, uh, uh. But this, it's because of the setting, because they get that grand entrance to walk on. Loudly let the trumpets pray. Tan, tan, tra. It's just so utterly grand. I have actually posted for theirs version of this. I'm going to put the link in the description. Please enjoy if you have a chance to do that, with 359 points. So this is the one that came second on the music list in the musical numbers list. I'm afraid it only comes 16th place because I just feel there are other numbers that just have more dramatic comedic stakes above this. But this is my Lord, a suppliant at your feet. What a delightful, emotional, dramatic number this is. So utterly beautiful. There are very few numbers that hit quite like this one does. And just one point above that, in 15th place we get Love Unrequited Robs Me of My Rest, which is the Lord Chancellor's patter song. In fact, is this the highest patter solo? I mean, I already know it is because it won the patter list, of course it is, but it bears repeating 
that this is just one of the most masterful songs in the canon when it comes to both Gilbert and Sullivan's writing and just considering how much you get to do as an actor with that and like what this means for the Lord Chancellor's psyche because when you consider that before this he's had like a little bit of mystery but you don't really quite know who he is but then Nis just reveals that he's so complex and so frighteningly repressed that he's got all this chaos going on inside him at the prospect of making this decision to marry Phyllis. So it's just it's just mm. reflective of how amazing of a character the Lord Chancellor is, and that's why the Lord Chancellor is my favourite character. Purely character when we think of nothing else. Character in the canon. Coming in, sixth place on this list is Princess Ida. Will continues to disagree with me about when anger spreads his wing. I wonder if, Will, maybe if you can put in the comments why it is that you love this song, because I have listened to it several times with what you've said in mind, and I'm still not really getting it. I find that this, that, and then you gaily sing, and then you gaily sing, da -da 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 -da. I, I find it so tone deaf and underwhelming compared to what's happened before. Like, they just had, I built upon a rock, for heaven's sake. And then, we just get this kind of wet fish. I I find it just this. What can you do with it? It is so against the energy of the previous choruses, of the soldiers who are meant to be terrifying, and these students who are meant to be very proud and wanting to go along. You know, to an extent with Ida. I know they have kind of decided they don't want to fight, but. That doesn't mean they're going to go from, we're too scared, Ida, we, we don't want to die, to, oh, I like fighting. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. I find it so weird and stupid and it makes me angry. Don't like this number at all. This is our duty plane. I just find a bit, oh, uh, okay. <laughs> so I think there's just a couple of numbers in this. Now, wouldn't you like to rule the roost? I also just find very underwhelming. I think when you consider... Act two in general in Princess Ida, you get that string of pearls, that's what people call it. Woman of the wisest wit, the world is but a broken toy, O Lady Fair of Lineage High. You get so many incredible songs. But then this one, do, do we really think that fits here? Do, do we really think that is as good as the others? I just I just don't. I, I guess the only the only thing about it is good that's really good is that it really fits into the sound world. So I get that. It's very academic sounding. It's, for, it's much like Lady Blanche's solo number. But yeah, which actually did better than all three of these songs, funnily enough. But then three songs that did spectacularly well with 337 points. We get I Built Upon a Rock, Princess Ida's Aria. It only came in 38th place. And like that might seem very low to some people. But again, I'm going to repeat. She's defeated already. There's no hope left. It's quite one note. And I find that when hope has gone, it's very hard to give the song the kind of emotional energy that it really needs. I find that with, in the alto song, in the, in the Mikado, even though she is singing about wanting to die, there is still an element of frustration and hope there as well. That is making her like stubbornly keep on living. But this to me, I just find it's a little bit dramatically flat. I'm not gonna lie. Tell me, anyone who's played Princess Idol, or any directors, anyone who has a different opinion, what can you do to, to give this song a little bit of color? Maybe help me out here with that. Still, it's in 38th place. Absolutely adore this number. Then with 370 points, in fifth place overall is The World Is But A Broken Toy. Again, this came first musically. I think that this just is the most gorgeous musical number in the canon. It is it is truly magical in a way that maybe even the three numbers above it aren't quite. It has this ethereal knowingness. And it's got this air of sinisterness too that's from what's come before and the fact that there's a deception going on here. But then in this moment, Hilarion and Ida, and even to some extent, Cyril and Florian, all just kind of come together and connect for this brief moment. Mm. It's the heart of the opera, in my opinion. However, so let me, t let me tell you a story. 
about when I first started doing GNS. So there's me, Rachel GNS Middle, 18 years old. I just performed in a concert in the chorus at St Andrews University and the next show we were doing was Princess Ida. We'd already auditioned, I'd not got a part but I was really happy to be in the chorus so I was alto chorus in Princess Ida and uh, I was just playing the CD on repeat over my parents' house when I went home for Christmas. I think my parents had gone out to do something and I was just listening to the Act 2 finale and I was just listening to this song over and over again. And I immediately identified it. And I was already quite familiar with a lot of the canon at this point as well, because I just listened to all of it. And this just occurred to me as this, this is one of the greatest things I've ever heard. And I've since then been absolutely obsessed with it. So I was 18 then. That has always really been my favourite number in the canon. And I think it still has to be because I want to just pay homage to that young person because now I'm of course terribly old I want to pay homage to that person who is now half the age I am now actually less than half the age I am now who latched on to this song as something very special and just picked that out as her favorite like for some reason and I want to just recognize that so even though maybe in my heart of hearts maybe I don't feel like this is the best number in the canon but it is it will always be because it's just so special to me because it's just been my favourite the whole time. And that is, who now has changed must wear his chain from Princess Ida. So Princess Ida contains my favourite musical number and my favourite number purely for music. So Princess Ida is, is, is done quite a lot better than I thought it would in these lists. And I am so struck every time I listen to this number to how I just never get bored of it. I've not yet directed Princess Ida. That's like one of the two, I mean, I'm not really including Thespis. It's one of the two I've not directed. Yeah, I've also not directed Utopia Limited, which I'm very excited about to do at some point. But this number is, for me, like the most vulnerable, dramatic, exposing moment in the canon. It's like a guy just completely like metaphorically and spiritually naked just spilling out his guts onto the floor to a person who was basically condemned into death like saying well I will die because that would be preferable to living without you loving me and you know in some more kind of pessimistic circles people might consider that a bit like pushy but I just don't see it in that way. To me, I see it as just very honest. Like he's not trying to manipulate her with this song. This is just an honest, true expression of what he feels. And I don't know if you really get that elsewhere in the canon because even though Iolanthe's song, it is absolutely stunningly beautiful and dramatically gorgeous. The song is kind of more about how the Lord Chancellor reacts to it. And and about how Iolanthe is reacting to his reaction more than the lyrics themselves, if that makes sense. So that, so as an actor playing Iolanthe, I don't know how much you'd really connect to the lyrics. I mean, yes, you would. Obviously you would. I can think of many ways in which I would. But I don't think there's any doubt that this song in Princess Ida, there's a more active connection from character to lyrics than in the Iolanthe song, because the lyrics that are being sung in this song are very much literally this is what I'm feeling right now and I'm saying it. Whereas in Iolanthe there are more confusing layers there. So I think there's just because of that gap I do think that this, this one has the edge but certainly best solo in the canon, best musical number in the canon is a number from Princess Ida, Hilarion's number, love it very much. Number five I have given to the gondoliers. Now the gondoliers is full of many beautiful, sparkling, gorgeous musical numbers. There are maybe some that I don't think are, are quite as good. To help unhappy commoners, I, I don't find very interesting. I've talked about that at length before, so I won't bore you with it. There lived a king as I've been told. Again, I just don't find this very imaginative. I actually quite like I Stole the Prince. I think that's actually quite a fun number. People tend to kind of put Don Al's solos together. They tend to lump them together and say, oh, neither of them are very good. But I think I, I Saw the Prince is just, is, is more jaunty for a start. It's got a bit more of an interesting comedic rhythm. Whereas this one, 
it's not really important to the narrative. It's like a little bit of a segue away from the narrative. And I don't really think that anyone is really too invested in what happens as a result of him singing this song. Like he's not really imparting any information that's particularly important, especially since nothing happens as a result of this point that, oh, they're, they're kind of treating servants like they're equals. But then nothing actually ever comes of that, ever. That, that, that plot then just dies. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, I don't hate it, but it's just, it's certainly not as exciting as some of the other songs in The Gondoliers. And also with 46 points, we get Bridegroom and Bride. It's pretty, but it's really an entrance song. I had to include it as its own number because I can't not. I mean, it's over a minute long. It's, it's a tune that doesn't occur anywhere else in the canon, but it, it's, it's a very functional number. And I think that that shows... However, let me take you through some of the more beautiful songs in the gondoliers. Now let the loyal legions gather round. This is my favourite Act 2 finale in the canon. So this one comes 37th place when it comes to musical numbers. I still ranked it above Comes the Pretty Young Bride. I do think that uh, because it is very long and it contains several different numbers, it can't really do like super well to an extent, but I think it's done better than where, than if I would have split the numbers up. Because it also contains that recit in the middle of it and everything, every bit in it is quite short and fragmented. But to me, it is absolutely glorious. It is perfect. I love the dramatic journey it takes you on. And yeah, it's just overall a really fantastic number. My favorite act two finale in the canon. With 358 points, so in 17th place, we get in a contemplative fashion. And this, <laughs> this is one of the funniest, cleverest numbers in the canon. I don't know if you could really call it masterful when it comes to pure music. So I think in the music list, it didn't do spectacularly well. But to me, it's just so clever, so indicative of this like joyful chaos, which Gilbert is so good at creating. It's just an absolute riot. It's a number that is kind of director proof as well, because I don't really see how you'd mess this up. There's only really one way of choreographing it. I've just, there's just, I've seen everyone just do this the same every time I've done it, but you don't need to mess around with it because it's so perfect on its own that you don't really have to kind of dress it up with bells and whistles and things. You don't need to do any kind of fancy staging. It just works so well. It almost works better if you do minimal staging because it's important to just hear the words. <laughs> it's so funny seeing these characters just so confused and so cross with each other, but as long as they're still likable, like don't make them hate each other. Like, why would you do that? It's annoying when these characters start to hate each other. Just, it's, they're confused. It's chaos, you know, lean into that. In 14th place, overall on the list, we have Now Marco Dia. Maybe I'm a bit exaggerating a little bit in which I think that Tessa's You lay your head upon the bed inside of sun. It's like one of my favorite musical moments in the canon. I still maintain it is. I think that bit is absolutely beautiful. But that whole love quartet, with the couples like disintegrating and being separated they don't even know for how long it is it really tells you who these four people are like far more than any of their dialogue does this is what i struggle with with the gondoliers their characters are quite shallow but this is a very this is a redeeming moment this really shows you as the audience that these characters are not shallow that they really do love each other very much and it's quite a hard job i think to kind of go from the lines that they've got and the kind of quite frivolous stakes they seem to have to then singing this. But, oh, what a gift. What a beautiful gift that these singers have. <laughs> Gondoliers, chock full of really glorious musical numbers. Now, in fourth place is one that surprised me. This is one that actually moved down as a result of my fiddling because another one that I took a number of actually moved above it. This one is the Grand Duke. So the Grand Duke moved down into fourth place after I did a bit of diddling. It actually came second on my music list. But I think this is probably fair. In the Grand Duke, even though its music is consistently very good, there are several numbers in it which I do think fall a little bit dramatically flat and maybe err on like a bit confusing. So I included both Why Who Was This Approaching and Now Way to the Wedding We Go on the list because they're both over a minute long and they both contain new material. So I, d I did cut the final one, the one that the chorus all start to sing and then that goes to the law, forbids the bands. Like that one I didn't include. But 
the initial one, you, you have to, <clears throat> you, you have to include that one. So why who was us approaching? Now away to the wedding we go. Oh, you're a pretty kind of fellow. The Grand Duke just seems to have several numbers. I would also maybe include were I a king and very truth that just don't really match up to some of these more mind bending numbers in the Grand Duke. It, maybe it suffers slightly from what Utopia Limited does and it, it just has so much material in it that there are going to be some numbers that just drag it down. Like had they just flat out not included them, Grand Duke probably would have come in second place. But because it does have, have these numbers, it drags the average down. And it does give the impression, I think, to people watching the Grand Duke that it's very long. When actually it's not really too much longer than the others if you perform it with the correct pace. But yeah, the Grand Duke, it isn't all smiles and sunshine. There are some numbers in it, which I'm not a big fan of. And they are a challenge as a director. But when you see my production of Grand Duke next year, see what you think for yourselves. The three best numbers in Grand Duke, in my opinion, of course. Now, Julia, come consider it from. This is utterly unique. There is no other number in the canon that does this. Maybe you could consider what the Fairy Queen does in the Act 1 finale of Iolanthe. That's quite similar because she's speaking over music. So yeah, I guess that's the closest you get to it. Josephine's aria, you get like a little bit of it, but she's still singing. She is still having to sing on a, on a note, whereas Julia is speaking in this. Absolutely unique. So this one came in 45th place. So that one has done, you know, not spectacularly well, but, you know, very well considering the, the number of numbers on this list. But I'm telling you now, as an actor, this is my favourite thing to perform. I may also link to that below as well, because I, I, I like it and I, I think I do it well. So, yeah, tell, tell me what you think of that. Now, in 31st place, I have given to... And I, I'm actually honestly surprised this came so low. And I'm kind of looking at it now thinking, hmm... Should this have actually come way higher up? But I think it is mostly the music that got it so high on the music list. And that is 10 minutes since I met a chap. But maybe when you consider it as a number, it's come just below, oh, is there not one maiden breast? And I imagine that is right, because I think that when you think of that number above it, there's a magic to that number that maybe 10 minutes since doesn't have. But having said that, it still came in 31st place. It's an absolutely fantastic number so full of dramatic and emotional stakes and so funny maybe it just lacks a bit of the heart that some of the ones above it does but this you know honestly it's an absolute riot really really love this song it brings out the character of Ludwig so well he's just this like comic oh like oh whoops <laughs> oh god <laughs> silly me in number 11th place I have given to so ends my dream slash all is dark some all is dreary and yeah, so it didn't do quite as well as Cheerily Carols a Lark. I think that's fair. I think the introduction to Cheerily Carols a Lark is just so unique in a way that this one isn't. But still, I love the fact that this has a, an introduction that's very solemn and very introspective that then leads into a huge extroverted comedic fun time. So this song is my favourite soprano aria in the canon I think it's absolutely dynamite to perform. Honestly, that, that section as Julia, when you get to do Julia Come Consider It From, all the way through that dialogue with the Baroness and into this song. Honestly, like there is no better 10 minutes on stage than that. I, I really challenge anyone else to come up with like a better section for any character in the canon than that 10 minutes. Like, oh, oh my God, that is so amazing. Is there, is there a better 10 minutes in the canon for any one character? I don't t tell me, I don't know. I mean, maybe just Mad Margaret's aria into that, into that following dialogue. That's also really good. I guess I'm thinking of the characters I've played. So maybe you come at me, tell, you, tell me like the best section that any character has in the canon. That would be a good thing to do, wouldn't it? So as a result of some of the diddling I did, which was actually in response to some people telling me, oh, it's unfair that or it's not right that patience ended up above iolanthe in the music list 
And so I thought, yeah, it's because it was because I had cut out all the reprises of 20 Love Sick Maidens We which probably wouldn't have done so well. So I listened to that and I went, OK, yeah, I probably shouldn't include all these numbers that have repeated material, all these really short numbers. So I took out Good Morrow, Good Lover. I took out Good Morrow, Good Lover. I took out Fairly Well Attractive Stranger. But the thing is, because I did that, I also had to take out I'm a Waterloo House Young Man. And when I did that, it just patience just rocketed up because its average went way up because I really, I mean... Though men have ranked my useless seam, I only gave 14 points to, so that one is very low down the list. But the elimination of Waterloo House Young Man brought patience up two places on this list. So in my efforts to try and make Iolanthe do better, the one that did way better as a result was actually patience and, and not Iolanthe. So thank you for that, everyone. That had an unintended consequence, but now patience is in third place, and I actually think that that kind of makes a lot of sense. Also, when I first put this uniform on, I don't really consider a particularly interesting number, as well as Pretty Pretty Maiden. I think the latter is extremely funny, but it's very simple, and there's not too much you can do with it. But I'm still, it's a number that's very close to my heart. I had a really lovely time doing this with Will when we played Patience and Grosvenor in Savoyna back in 2018. So I have very fond memories of this number. It's still got 108 points, but so still did pretty good. But these top three numbers in the list, in fact, a list where we are love, confess, didn't make it into these top three numbers i'm trying to see where it actually came it came 54th place on the list so it actually came below a marvelous illusion i'm just quite interested in where these uh ending of the act one for nines. we also had to yield at once to such a foe that came just two points above that as well i hear the soft note which got 322 points putting it in 53rd place i think for a very standard stand and sing number this has done very well really beautiful musically do i think it's the best choral number in the canon no i actually don't i haven't talked about that one yet kind of ever and i'm about to so i'm excited about that and what else has done really well in patience we get in a doleful train which has 336 points putting it in 39th place what an amazing double chorus. I don't even need to tell you guys so much about this one because I think we all love it. I think this number is one of those truly iconic numbers that has also happened to do really, really well on this list. And the top number from Patience only came in 23rd place. This is the interesting thing. You think of numbers from Princess Ida where two came in the top 10 and that was only in sixth place. But this is in third place and it just hasn't even gotten to the top 20. But that's because the standard of the numbers in Patience is just so particularly consistent. I find that Patience to be one of the most consistent operas in the canon, like along with Mikado. I feel like Patience and Mikado, and to some extent Iolanthe, they are three of the operas that I think have not done badly in any category at all. Like their music is good. They are funny. They are dramatic. They have emotional stakes. And they, all three of them also have just great musical numbers all the way through. There's nothing really particularly bad in them. But certainly Patience and Mikado, I think, are the two that are, are going to do really well when we actually get to the final master list. I think when it comes to the other ones that I seek to repeatedly go get really high marks, like Yeoman and Grand Duke, Yeoman and Grand Duke do have quite decisive weaknesses, whereas Patience and Mikado, like, they, they, they don't really. They don't really have any weaknesses at all. Am I Alone and Unobserved, 23rd place. A lot of this is the recit. It is one of the best recits in the canon, in my opinion. I didn't talk about it in my recits video because we just included this in the Pata Aria itself. This air severe, bam, is but a near me, a bam, venia, bam, da, 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 bam, is it a wild, of guy, do, this costume chaste, is but, is but good taste, misplaced, do, can't sing I don't know it well enough to sing it but just it takes you on such a journey it whams you in the face makes you listen to Bunfell wow we are getting to meet this character all over again he we didn't know who this person was until now and he's letting us in on the secret and audiences love being let in, let in on secrets and Bunfell then becomes this character 
who is not only like the villain of the piece, but he's also like super likable and relatable. And that is just the best kind of character. Like someone who gets to be flawed, someone who gets to be like, like not very nice sometimes, but then also he's kind of cute and lovable and we can't help but kind of root for him <laughs> in a way. But that rests it and that, and the song itself, it's just so prevalent. Like the lyrics still make absolute 100% sense today. I mean, maybe you change some of the references to more specific things, but just in terms of like how people just love pretension and the, well, if I don't understand something, that must mean it's really deep. You know, it's so short sighted, but Bunthorn's like in on it. And that's why he's kind of an anti-hero because he's like manipulating all these posh people. And that's kind of, fun in a way so you kind of root for him slightly and that's why Bunthorn's great and Patience has some of the best and Patience has consistently some of the best musical numbers in the canon throughout the running time of the opera if Sophia I choose to marry it's clear that medieval art Lady Jane's aria a heavy dragoon yes 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 I cannot tell what this love may be lovers are playing a song like there's no duds in it that's the thing, because even that bottom number that brought it maybe down even one place, though men have ranked my useless scene, that's usually cut. Like, Patience is, is just absolutely full of numbers that you, you just can't fault. <laughs> you know, you can nitpick like I'm doing, you can be overly pedantic like I'm doing on these videos, but there's, you know, you, they're not bad. There's nothing bad you can really say about them. And that makes Patience just one of these operas that is just so strong in every area. So thank you, Patience, for giving yourselves for giving yourself to us. So in second place, we have the aforementioned The Mikado. So The Mikado only came in sixth place when we were talking about music, but it came all the way in second place when we talk about musical numbers instead. There are a couple of numbers that I don't find terribly whelming. Mia Summer, Mia Summer only got 30 points. A Sunday It May Happen got 68 points. And the thing is, this, like, might be a song it might be the best thing in the show just depending on if you change the lyrics properly i've just seen too many productions of this where like people like seem to be going out of their way to like be balanced but in being balanced just end up being offensive and, like it is possible to be balanced and like not offend people like you don't need to pander to the right like you don't need to think oh well in the set in the you know, for the idea of being centrist, I'm going to, like, somehow pretend that, like, climate change is a hoax. It's like, no, like, it's like as much as we, as much as people get annoyed by what Just Stop Oil are doing, like, they're right. You, you can't, you can't deny that they're correct. And people are like, why don't they just try a different way to get across the message they're trying to get across? I'm like, guys, they've tried that. <laughs> they've tried everything to get this across to you. There's been, like, prominent like expert scientists speaking to world leaders about the UN saying like we have to act now C climate change is going to destroy humanity we have to start doing things now right now otherwise it's going to be too late you have prominent expert people saying this to world leaders and nobody cares it's not even in the newspaper but when just stop oil like spray graffiti on the building suddenly it's in the newspaper so you're like hmm like maybe that's why they're doing it and even if you think, oh, that's so annoying, why can't they choose a different way? They're still in the news, aren't they? It's still making you think about the environment. I mean, are you gonna are you gonna be saying to yourself, oh, because Just Stop Oil has like graffiti sprayed Fort them a Mason, like because of that, I'm gonna like out of spite leave my lights on when I don't have to? It's like, no, you're not, because you're not idiots. And you're not gonna be spiteful for no reason. So the actions of Just Stop Oil are not going to make people less likely to be environmentally conscious because anything they're doing already, they're going to continue doing in spite of them. Unless you're just a terrible person. <laughs> so they can only do good, you know? And yeah, I don't agree with them interrupting performance of Les Mis. I don't agree with that either. I think that's really pants. Like as an actor, I don't like that. But at the same time, I'm kind of recognising that I don't that they have to try everything because we are going to die, okay? We are going to die unless we do something. Your children will die. There will not be humanity if you do not do something now. The flowers that Bremen is playing, tra -la. 
talking about the end of the world, back into the patter guy trying to be convinced to marry the alto. Again, there's nothing wrong with this song. It's still got 70 points. It's just a bit like, oh, okay, it's a song now, it's over. But hey, it's a great song, and I don't think and it's it's fun to sing, and I like I like singing it as a soprano. I'm in a hotel very right nice, so I can't sing at maximum volume. But there we go. That's my little tidbit for you today. But let's talk about those amazing moments in the Mikado. So we've 351 points. So coming in 24th place, we get Behold the Lord High Executioner. One of the funniest, most exciting, most dynamic, hilarious songs in the canon with one of the best character introductions. I mean, maybe coming second to Despard and Mad Margaret, but like honestly, introduce the introduction of the Patter Guy. It's so grand that he's just like, Taken from a game, DJ. <laughs> it's just so gentle <laughs> and so unassuming. In 10th place overall, with 365 points, we have I Am So Proud. So yeah, this number did uh, ultimately do quite a bit better than with Wiley Brain Upon the Spot. I think a lot of it was, I had previously not really enjoyed that section where the three baritones sing together. I found it a bit muddled, but then listening to it again and really thinking about it since then, I actually disagree with my past self. I think it actually is like super chaotic and fun. And it's really quite indicati indicative of the Patter guy's like mental situation, like mental chaos going on in his head. And the stakes are so real in this song, whereas in Wiley Brain, you don't really feel the same kind of stakes. So I think that this song does does have the edge in terms of that, but what a cracking song. It has one of the most iconic endings to any song ever. The Citizen Son of Sun is in the doll, dog, dog, etc. My favourite number in the Mikado is, is taken out of an Act 1 finale. It is, again, the ending of an Act 1 finale, and it is actually my favourite ending of any Act 1 finale which is you torrents roar, you tempest howl. It's this idea that you have this crazy, like awful person, like infiltrating what is meant to be this beautiful, happy event, but then they drang her out with celebration. And that, to me, that is just such a message of hope. I, I, it, ma it makes me it makes me so happy, and I'm not talking about drowning out voices of people who are reasonable. I'm talking about drowning out. Oh, so I'm not just saying, oh, I don't want negative energy. You know, let's just like shout over people who have actual problems. I mean, people who are trying to like ruin you and crush you and bring you down, and to just say, I'm not listening to you. I'm going to rise above this. There's something so wonderfully powerful about that. We do not heed their dismal sound joy reigns everywhere around. The fact that that starts off as a solo and then it becomes a duet and then it becomes everyone singing. Mm. It's just, oh, I love it. I love it so much. It's one of my favourite, it's one of the favourite moments I have in the whole canon. It, it's, it's come number seven on my list overall. What an absolutely spine tingling moment that is. So, Number one on my best music list went to Yeoman of the Guard and number one on my best musical numbers list also goes to Yeoman of the Guard. I mean, with only 12 points, we have Rapture Rapture, which is pretty much my least favourite thing in the canon. <laughs> not actually. It's not my very <laughs> least favourite thing in the canon, but I just, I, I don't enjoy it. And I'm not going to talk about it anymore. With 48 points, we get a laughing boy, but yesterday it's fine. It's just quite underwhelming and it's not narratively necessary and it's obvious why people cut it. So maybe if I hadn't even included that number, which is often cut, yeah, we would have done even better, but it's still one. With 74 points, we get When Our Gallant Norman Foes. I actually really like the music in this, especially when the men come in, we get the screw a twist and da 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 It is exciting. I think it's definitely got some tension in it. It's got some dramatic stakes, but ultimately I'm not connecting with this character. Like I don't really find her that interesting. Right, so then all three of these top three numbers are in the top 10. And they are actually number four, number three, and number two <laughs> in the top 10. So fourth place goes to the quartet, when a wooer goes a wooing. This is like one of the most iconically emotional moments in the canon. When I 
was a newly formed fan of GNS, this was easily like my equal first favourite song as long along with Who Now Is Chain Must Wear This Chain, but Hilarion song just somehow sticks high with me. Also, in my trio of favourite songs back when I was first listening to GNS is So Please You So We Much Regret, which I still maintain is brilliant, but it actually ended up not, you know, it didn't do badly. It, it still got 28th place, so it still did extraordinarily well. It came just above Tower Waters, actually. I put it above Tower Waters. That's how much I like it. But anyway, those were my, like my three favourite songs when I was first starting to become a GNS fan. And they've all three of them done very well, because it is very special to me, those three songs. But Where Do Woo Goes and Wooing, I mean, it's just full of this really rich, layered emotion from... Well, Jack Point and Phoebe, I suppose, but then also Elsie and Fairfax have just cemented their love and decided to get married. And if you do make this into something genuine, I think it can be spectacularly beautiful. There's no reason why this has to be shallow. I think you can make Elsie and Fairfax's relationship very powerful and very loving. Now, in second place, though, there's a number that I've not really talked about yet, or at least not on its own. And this is a number that I took out of the Atwin finale. All frenzied, all frenzied, all frenzied friends with, this, with despair, I actually put in 13th place because I don't think it's quite as good as this bit. But the prisoner comes to meet his doom, I have put in third place. I would say, honestly, I know a lot of people don't think they want to be in the Yeoman of the Guard chorus, like especially in the Citizens chorus, but it is worth it to sing the music. It really, really is. I got so much pleasure from when I directed Yeoman and there weren't enough sopranos, so I just slotted myself into the chorus. And honestly, I got this obscene amount of pleasure from singing just the soprano line of this chorus. It is absolutely stunning. And it does something to your throat. Like, you know the feeling you get when you, like, you're holding back tears or you're going to cry? Like when the introduction comes in and you hear that, it, it, it does that to you. It's like it's like your body is empathising with the music. It's like the music is itself imbued with this kind of hopelessness. And although I don't like to feel hopeless, there's something cathartic in listening to music that is hopeless because it kind of makes you feel less alone. So sometimes these really sad music, that's why I love Radiohead. <laughs> I love kind of quite sad music because it does make you feel less alone and this is just a really good example of something which just brings something to the surface of the human body that maybe was squashed down and it's a thing that I like to do when I'm directing like uh, I, I want to be able to make people feel in a healthy way so I don't want to like do it in like a smug way. Sometimes I feel like directors think they're cleverer than the audience <laughs> and they want to like say, hmm, I'm going to send a message to you. And it's kind of, it's got this air of smugness. Whereas all I want to do is to like help people, like especially British people who were kind of taught, and British men who were taught to be kind of like repressed and not show their emotions. I feel like music like this is actually actively helpful it is emotionally rich and cathartic. And for me, I have no trouble showing my emotions. I mean, bizarrely, sometimes I do. I think sometimes in, in some situations I feel a bit stunted, but generally I have no trouble talking to people about my emotions. I'm very free with my emotions. That's why a lot of people find me difficult, but it's, I'm just trying to be authentic. I'm trying to be myself more and more as the years go by. And I wish it was more of the norm that people were more honest and more, free with their emotions as I am. I think it's actually healthier. The thing is I have to be because I'm not mentally healthy so I have to be honest and free with them otherwise I'll just implode. <laughs> so I'm actually much healthier than I used to be but what I feel this does it just it helps people. Sullivan's music I think is actively helpful. It's emotionally helpful. It's like I want people to go to my production of The Omen of the Guard in June 2024 and come back thinking, wow, that was like a therapy session. <laughs> no, I want to help people. I want to I want to help bring out beauty inside people by making them look at raw emotion, but real raw emotion, you know, not for the sake of it. And that's why I love this number. It's just beautiful.
it's it's also one that right at the start I latched onto. I thought, oh, that's good. I love that. But then number two. So the second number on this list is one that Marisa and I realised was going to do really, really well back when we were doing our showstoppers number list. And I'm glad it didn't win because the thing is, there's something about this number which maybe makes me feel it doesn't quite have the same heart that the one above it has. So I put it in second place because of that. But that number is Hark, What Was That Sir? Like a Ghost, His Vigil Keeping. There is no other number, I think, in the canon that just gets so much done as this one. It goes through so many different styles. It has so many different emotional colours in it. The characters would all be reacting in a very different way to the situation. It's like, especially if you've got Elsie and Phoebe on stage, which you, you may as well. It, you, you feel, well, they have to be because they, they then get the information from it. So they have to be there. But you, you really feel like you, this takes you on such a dramatic, but also like musical journey as well. And it is so funny. It's got that added element. I said this in my duets video, I think, about a million years ago. But this song could have been a solo. This song could have been Wilfred doing the patter song and the chorus responding to that. But you've got this extra added element of Jack Point trying to like pimp up the story in a similar way to how they do in Mikado in uh, The Criminal Cried. Jack Point is like tr is trying to add extra elements of the story just to kind of make it more believable, more exciting. Like, we don't know. But he's like, well, I would rather call it Crawley. <laughs> Why? Why are you doing that? It's so silly, but it also is just so perfect and so much. It is such a reflection of their relationship. So not only is it's got some of the best musical setting in the canon, and it's about the most high stakes situation you can imagine, but it's also absolutely hilarious and it does so much for every character that's involved with it. Like, not only the characters even singing, but the characters reacting to it. And that is why, that honestly, like, I, I, I think this really is one of the absolute best numbers in the canon. And that is that has come from The Omen of the Guard. So, I'm going to give you a quick reminder of the top 20. So at 20, we have The Hours Creep on a Pace. At 19, we have My Name is John Wellington Wells. Number 18, we have Henceforward of a Verity from the At One finale of Utopia Limited. In number 17, we have In a Contemplative Fashion from the Gondoliers. 16th place, we have A Lord, a Suppliant at Your Feet. And in 15th place, we have Love Unrequited. 14th place, we have Now Marco Dear. In 13th place, All Frenzied, Frenzied with Despair. 12th place, we have Oh Why Am I Moody and Sad. 11th place, we have So Ends My Dream, All Is Darksome. In 10th place, we have I Am So Proud. Number 9 is Cheerily Carols the Lark. Number 8, When the Foeman Bears His Steel. Number 7, You Torrents Roar, You Tempests Howl. Number 6, All Is Prepared, Your Gallant Crew Awaits You. Not for the ceiling and for signing, but that's also probably done pretty well. Number five, we have The World is But a Broken Toy. Number four, we have When a Wooer Goes a Wooing. Number three, The Prisoner Comes to Meet His Doom. Number two, Hark, What Was That, Sir? Like a Ghost is Vigil Keeping. And finally, in first place, we have Whom Thou Hast Chained Must Wear His Chain. So let me just take a moment to say, if you're not already subscribed to this channel, please do subscribe. I promise that next year I'm going to be making a lot more content with shorter videos so you won't have to sit through these mammoth videos anymore. But I do hope from time to time we can revisit some of these lists and maybe think about times when I did my calculations a bit wrong. I'm as ever revising all these calculations. I'm going to twiddle with the music list to make sure that the ch same changes I made here also apply there so that might move patience up again as it did in this list and maybe move Iolanthe up one or two spots. On New Year's Eve on the 31st of December I'm going to finally release my video where I take on everything I've learned and try and pedantically calculate which is the best opera. As a reminder this is just the best opera in my opinion. I'm not trying to be classic FM and say this is a definitive best opera list. I may even change my mind next year. But in my opinion, it's all my opinion. And it is my opinion that you subscribe to this video series. And I will see you next time.